All right. Hello, everybody. Drooplers, New Yorkers, and otherwise curious folk, I'm Jed, um, Maestro Jed on Drupal.org and other places of the internet. I uh, will be doing a little bit of MCing for you tonight. Let me, uh, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you know, we'd love to see your face if you'll turn your video camera on. Um, if not, we're glad you joined us. Uh, no problem there. If you're not speaking, if you can mute your mic, uh, it certainly helps keep down on the chatter. We have a Slack community that we're going to use tonight for chit-chatting and conversating, and we're going to do that instead of using Zoom's chat feature. Uh, that way there's a record. It's a community of ours in Slack. So we encourage you all, if you're not in our Slack, that's drupalnyc.org slash Slack, and the specific channel hashtag meetup inside that Slack is where we'll be having conversations throughout the evening. We have danced around it, but here are the presentations tonight that uh, I'm looking very forward to. The first one's the config management we talked about. That's going to be presented by Eric Saad. And then we're going to talk to the maintainer of the web forms module, Jacob Rotswitz, and uh, he's going to present on the web form module's greatest hits and do a ask me anything. A uh, shout out to the folks that helped organize the meeting tonight um, and the Drupal NYC board and organizers are always working for you guys. Uh, so thanks to all those guys. I mentioned our Slack earlier, uh, you know, please connect with us. Uh, the Slack is there again on the screen, and then also the Twitter account. If you are tweeting tonight or talking about the meetup in the future, using the hashtag DrupalNYC is much appreciated. We always like to give a big shout out to the Drupal Association. The Drupal Association does so much for us in the Drupal community, you know, beyond maintaining the Drupal.org and helping us developers interact with the Drupal uh, uh, ecosystem and community, you know, they're invaluable. If you could be part of the Drupal Association, that goes a long way. There are ways to, uh, uh, to donate and become that member. And just any support you could show the Drupal Association, you know, keep them in your thoughts. They do great work. Some upcoming events. Uh, the Drupal Community Year End Celebration and Open House is immediately after our meetup. Um, so stick around. We'll put a link in uh, Zoom for you to join that. DrupalCon Europe is coming up. Um, there's a link on the screen there, and that will be December 8th through December 11th. Uh, I think that's San Francisco Doug Year End Happy Hour, December 10th. Uh, S F D U G. I think that's San Francisco Doug. Uh, so that's on the calendar. Florida Drupal Camp, we talked about that at the beginning of the call. If you joined us a little late, that sounds like it's really come together well, and we'll be kicking off the 2021 Drupal events. It's a virtual event, uh, Florida Drupal Camp. There's more information and more events at drupal.org slash community slash events. Are you interested in speaking during Drupal NYC? We'd love to have you. It could be any length. Sometimes we do lightning talks where it's short, five minute, 10 minute topics, or, you know, an in-depth talk that's 45 minutes uh, plus something like that you're going to see tonight. Uh, it could be about any topic. It doesn't have to be about Drupal. Uh, anything you feel like is related to this community and this community would be curious about. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, all skill levels welcome, you know, beginner topics all the way through advanced. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. So if you're interested in speaking, please reach out to us. We've got an email address up on the screen speak at drupalnyc.org. You can also reach out in Slack uh, if that's more convenient. We always like to take an opportunity to ask, you know, is anybody hiring or is anybody looking? Um, sometimes when it's noisy, we, we sidebar that into our Slack channel. But, you know, tonight, I think if somebody wants to raise their hand in Zoom, I think that's completely possible. So if you are hiring, know of somebody that is hiring, or if you yourself are looking for something, uh, we'd love to hear from you. I'm raising my hand. Um, You're good. <laughs> I work with Canopy Studios. We are a Drupal and WordPress agency, fully remote, and we are looking to hire 
WordPress and Drupal developers and project managers anywhere from mid to senior level, senior level, level and tech leads. We're looking to expand, I think, four Drupal positions before the end of the first quarter. So that's Canopy, K-A-N-O-P-I. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Victor. Um, I'm actually joining in from uh, Connecticut. I, uh, I'm an independent contractor. I'm a UX designer um, looking to collaborate with the Drupal developer. I work uh, with uh, one specific client, uh, which is a university um, based, and uh, I just do most of the Drupal work for them. So I have a, a three to six month uh, Drupal project that's going on right now. And uh, I put together a sort of a job description. Uh, do you think that do you think the Slack is the best place to post that or can I post it on the chat? Yeah, yeah. Telling us about is great, but yeah, I would certainly put that in the meetup uh, channel. And there is also a jobs channel in the community. So maybe both places, but okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Um, hey, I, oh, and hey, hey, I'm JD, uh, and uh, I've got a client right now um, that I'm doing some some back end development work for, migration work, and uh, we are in need of a uh, front end developer, um, someone who can do theming on a new Drupal 9 site. Um, so if you're interested, uh, get in touch. Excellent. Well, very uh, in a similar vain let's uh, introduce ourselves uh we talked about raising our hands or or you know maybe the group's manageable enough that we can all be polite but i introduced myself i'm jed and i'm glad to see all of you uh i work at linkwell health i've been a drupal developer for uh quite a while now so. who's next if you're willing no pressure i'm jake i'm saying hi i'm presenting <laughs> I don't know. I think that's a good enough introduction because I have to talk and reintroduce myself again. So right. I went. Yeah. Here, I'm going to hand it off. Look forward Eric. To it. Oh, no, yeah, I'm handing it off to Ker Eric. You go and then Kermit. And then we uh, okay, keep going. There we go. Right. Yeah. yeah force I'm, I'm it. Eric, you're, you're going, in two minutes, you will see my, you will see my um, abbreviated CV. It's part of my presentation. Um, so I'm senior Drupal developer at Memorial Sloan Kettering, programmer for 10 years, Drupal user for 10 years, found Drupal pretty much when I started this career. And um, yeah, that's me. Hey, and I'm uh, Kermit Ramirez. So I work with those guys at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And uh, I'm a web specialist for uh, managing a subsite on the main site. Um, been at the hospital since 2007. So quite some time there. But nice to meet you guys if I haven't already. I might as well go, I'm Scott. I do some Drupal work, a small Drupal shop, but lately I've been playing with OpenCart for a real simple e-commerce solution. And if you want something really, really basic, it's it's fun to use, uh, but you realize the difference between that and Drupal in terms of the power. And there's a lot of things I need to do that in Drupal are easy to do. I have to go and like comment out code to remove something, but it's a real lightweight uh, shopping cart if that's all you want. Don't forget any CMS. There's virtually nothing in there for that. Uh, I could say hello. Uh, my name is Ben. I work at Google in New York and uh, work with Drupal some and past jobs, but not my current job. Actually, I've been working with some folks in the community. Now my phone's talking to me. I said the word Google. Uh, I'm working with some folks in the community on, on getting some performance enhancements in the Drupal core. We actually got lazy loading for images going on in Drupal 9 recently. Working on other things like this in the Drupal core. I'll be giving a talk, I think, at DrupalCon next week. I wanted to just stop by and say hello to people and see what it was like to be at a, at a meetup. I'll say hi. Hi, this is uh, right. Jeff Markell. I am a Drupal architect and manager at Johnson & Johnson, and uh, happy to be here. I'll pop Hi. on. 
So, Holing, go for it. Hey, hi, this is Holing. I work for the New York Public Library. I take care of the website. You see it, I'm a DevOps engineer. So mostly on AWS, I started off as a Drupal developer. And I'm JD, I'm a freelance Drupal architect and my focus is on the planning and uh, implementation of complex web applications using Drupal. And I am based in Jersey City, New Jersey. Uh, I'm Neil Drum. I work for the Drupal Association on the engineering team there. So uh, I'm one of the people who helps build Drupal.org. I'll go next. I'm Ryan Choi. I'm from Children's Aid. Um, we're based out in New York City, our nonprofit. Um, and when I joined uh, this meetup, I heard you guys were talking about Pentheon and Acquia. So we host on Acquia, so I could give you guys some, you know, some, some experience uh, talk if you guys wanna, if anybody is interested. I'll go. My, my name is Amy June. I work with Canopy Studios. Well, I work, they pay me, but I work in the community and I help organize different events, including SF Doug. Um, if y'all wanna speak at SF Doug, I'll take some speakers cause it's virtual. Um, but my favorite part of Drupal is teaching people how to give back. So um, that's what I like to do the best. Excellent. Anyone else? Uh, well, I'm Ralph from Germany and I'm in content strategy. Excellent. And, um, well, it's great to, was there someone else? I'm Joanne Patalano. I work at UMass Amherst and I've been working with Drupal. I started with Drupal 6 and then 7 and as I was talking before, uh, getting up to speed with 8 um, and developing locally and I don't know, I've been doing it for a while so I got pretty good at it. Um, front and just, you know, I've done some custom modules and some back, definitely, yeah, not, not really just front end. So anyway, that's it. Yeah. Well, it is great to see everyone, and I hope we continue conversing in Slack and in future meetups. So it was nice to meet everybody. So let's get to our first talk, Drupal Configure Management. Uh, Eric, I look forward to it, and I'm gonna hand you the baton. So you do that, JD. Sorry. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, that's what I do, right? And then everything is good. This will stop other sharing. Continue. That looks like the right thing to do. Okay, let's put this aside. Share this. Okay, all right, let's get this. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, tonight we're going to look at um, configuration management in D8 and D9. We're going to look at the core system. We're going to look at a suite of contributed modules that we use and we like very much. And I'm also going to talk about the admin tools. Um, it would be remiss if I did not talk about them because they exist and they have some nice um, attributes to them. Um, and, and that brings up sort of oh, it brings up sort of a talking point, which uh, Joanne, you, you, you started with, which is like, who is my audience in this presentation? I mean, configuration management is a system that's been been around since Drupal 8 has been around. Um, so but I want people to be able to accept to be to find it accessible. Um, people coming into Drupal 8 or um, people who are still using Drupal 7. Sorry, I shouldn't say still people who are using Drupal 7 or people who are complete experts at this. Hopefully everyone will find something interesting about this presentation. Um, I, I already mentioned all of this stuff. Um, that's me. Drupal's the, uh, you know, the stuff, you know, as soon as I heard about users and groups, I was a FileMaker um, developer um, before uh, going into real programming. Um, but when I heard about users and groups in Drupal, I thought, oh, that's for me. And I've been, been with it ever since. Okay, so tonight we're gonna, as I mentioned, gonna look at core. Uh, we're gonna talk about a configuration system workflow. And tonight things are, are not primitive, but, but they are, I don't have a Pantheon account at this time. So we're gonna look at a local site. 
we're going to we're going to talk about Git. We're going to be doing a few commits. Um, GitHub is the um, the hub for the uh, re repository. There's an upstream site that we're going to be making changes to, and so it's all basically I roll I rolled these developments these development sites on my own, right? I'm using uh, just just to fill up the conversation. I'm using home, I use Homebrew on my on my local system. I like it very much. Um, use it for everything these days, even like installing Chrome and stuff like that. And up on um, uh, something called greengeeks.com, which I don't know how I ended up there, um, but I have about 10 or so very tiny sites and I pay them a minuscule amount of money and it's all shared um, uh, sites. And um, I just create my own, my own um, um, servers up there. Okay, contributed modules. We're gonna talk about configuration split. That's the real star here. Uh, we're gonna talk about configuration ignore and I guess they're actually config. That's, those are sort of typos. And we're gonna talk about config override and then we will review core admin tools. Okay, let's start with some definitions. Oh, I need to get this out of my way. For ADA purposes, I will be reading these definitions. Okay, this definition comes directly from Drupal.org documents. In Drupal, configuration is the collection of admin settings that determine how the site functions as opposed to the content of the site. Configuration will typically include things such as the site name, the content types and fields, taxonomy, vocabularies, views, and so on. Another, another really good definition. Um, this one from, oh, I jumped ahead. Oh, I missed the first one. No, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I think I got out of order there. Yep, views and so on. Second definition comes from Drupalize Me, another very good source for um, for Drupal learning. Drupal's configuration system helps to solve the problem of moving changes in configuration from development to production. It does this in two ways: by providing a unified way to store configuration, and by providing a process by which configuration changes can be imported and exported between instances of the same site. Last definition, the briefest one from Acquia. Drupal 8 allows configuration to be imported into the database or exported to disks as YAML files. Okay, so here's, here's I guess, my additive to it or, 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 or just a slide. Drupal takes your configuration settings, exports them into the file system. Well, that's a little obvious. Once the files are in place on another instance of the site, Drupal can import the files into the database, which updates the configuration. I'm gonna demonstrate all of this. Config import is is all or nothing. That's I can attribute that to to Mike down in Florida. Um, I have a couple of um, uh, of his screenshots, which are, which are really really helpful. Um, the the best thing that I like about it, importing configurations, strangely enough, are the errors. Because if you have an error when you're importing configuration, you know instantly there's a problem with your build. Okay, so to further define. Um, the Drupal database stores two types of data, content and configuration, okay? Developers define and test configuration on a local system, commit their work and push code and configuration to dev, test and live. Tonight, we're just using dev. Okay, so this, this is the one, this, this is the one that we're talking about. And I wanna just say that for tonight, Right, there's no production, there's no stage, there's no multi devs, and there's only one local. But that should be fine because it really we can really just just look at look at the problem space, and I can show you the solutions that that we're we've implemented, and hopefully, you know this this will be a helpful um, uh, presentation. So the idea here is that code goes upstream. This is you. This is you down here. Right, code goes upstream along with the configuration, right? And then the only thing that comes down from your upstream instance of your site is the database and the files directory. Okay, since active configuration is in the database, copying a local database upstream to move configuration will overwrite content. We don't wanna override content, right? Further, moving a subset of database tables to move configuration is not recommended. Don't do that, right? It's a relational database, It's that's just, I don't know. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Few, a few terms here, right? Configuration in the database is the active configuration. Okay. And we're going to use Git to move configuration files between environments. All right. This is another really, really good uh, um, example of a workflow, right? So this is you developing on your local, your local Drupal 8 database, right? You're, or, or nine at this point. 
you're exporting your configuration and I'm going to show show you exactly what I mean by configuration right now your configuration is in YAML files, which is also a part of your local Git repository, which you push to remote still in YAML import and the changes come out on your on your upstream instance. Oops. Okay. I don't know. I like to write things out too. So I, I just rewrote basically what I just said only, only in lines. You know, I'll, I'll share these slides. Obviously, I did them in PowerPoint so they would export. I, I use reveal and printing that doesn't really work out all that well. So this is just basically what you're doing yet again. And again, for ADA purposes, I will read this. Syn syncing con config involves the following steps. Drush config export, drush commit YAML, drush push, excuse me, git push, git pull, Drush config import. Okay. Configuration files are exported to the sync directory. There was a lot of discussion about what to actually call that directory. Ultimately, it landed on that name. Right? Could be called anything in your in your own instance, but why why not? Why why change that? Location of the sync directory can be outside of the Drupal root, which makes which is what makes things starts to make things very interesting. All right. So now I'm going to be be doing things like this. I use this. Um, lovely little Divi program, which allows me to set a lot of um, keyboard shortcuts to move my to move the windows around on my screen. This this helps a lot for me. If you if anyone finds this confusing, please 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 shout out, and I'll go a little slower, or I'll say what I'm moving screens around to. Also, I want to make sure that everybody can see what I see. Is everything large enough for you to see? I can make this bigger, obviously. Right, and this I don't know. Can I make it bigger? No, maybe from here. But all right, by your silence, I'll assume that you can see what I'm seeing. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, and I, and I use PHP Storm, but something about PHP Storm and the um, um, the, the settings PHP because the settings PHP ownership changes very quickly. It makes PHP Storm a little bit cuckoo. So I'm going to stick to Vim for the most part when we're we're looking at we're looking at this. Yeah. Okay. All right. Make this bigger for sure. All right. So ignore all of this. This comes later, right? All we're really interested in is this line, this line 269. Okay. And basically it's explaining it to you. The file we're in, by the way, right now is, is the settings PHP. Okay. It's, if you read through that file, you'll see all of this comes right in your settings PHP. Great, right? You know, so all, all we really have to do is, is, is work on the settings array, change the, the um, config sync directory index to a directory outside of your web root, which is exactly what I'm doing right here. This, li this line is what you get on your initial install of Drupal. It's usually at the bottom of the settings PHP. I just put it here just as an example. This is perfectly okay to export to, but again, you're, you're inside your Drupal root. And the idea here is, is that if we keep the configuration files outside of the Drupal root, then, the, then our repo can, can be solely about the sync files, about the config files. We don't have to bother with uh, uh, keeping any any of our uh, Drupal or our contrib modules under revision, under, under version control, because they're not ours. Drupal is updated on a regular basis. Modules are updated on a regular basis. If you're not writing custom code, what, what, why burden yourself by having, having another repo? OK. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is just a, a tree view of, of exactly what I'm talking about, right? So settings.php, which is this guy over here, right? We right is next to the config directory and in the config directory there's a sync directory which contains the 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 site configuration right and we're going to do something very trivial on the system on the system site uh file which is change the slogan but i but i i hope that it will exemplify what um what happens when you change a configuration on a local system export that to the um, upstream system and import it into the upstream system Okay, good. So now I think we're ready to take a look at that. Oh, why didn't that launch? That's fine. I have it here. Okay, right. This this I found really really interesting. Oh, oops, I'm I'm on the wrong tool. That's what's wrong here. Drop is automatic. That's better. Yeah, there we are. 
Right. So th this I this I found very interesting, and I have that I have that loaded as well. Okay. So where does where does the active configuration actually get stored? Well, it gets stored in the database. And you know, this is the thing, thing about things sometimes is that when you name a thing that's very obvious, it's really easy to understand, right? So the table in which the configuration is stored, the active configuration is stored in the Drupal database is called config. How great is that, right? Okay, so when we do a describe on that table, we see that that we have a data column. The data column is a long blob, which I think always or usually at least in Drupal means that we're talking about serialized data, right? So here, so for the moment, let's actually roll back just a little bit. I'm on my local site, right? Oops. I'm on my local site, right? And I wanna add a slogan here, okay? So, so this is a configuration change that I'm making. Okay, so now this configuration change exists somewhere, right? Where does it exist? Only in the database, right? And we can see when I make th this particular query, right? If you sort of sift through, um, you know, what you're looking at here, you will see that we get to slogan and we see Drupal NYC meetup. Very nice, okay. What would we like to do? Trivial though it may be, we would like to see on the upstream site, right? We would like to see that same thing. Okay, we don't wanna just type it in and save it. That's no good. We wanna actually use the configuration to make that happen. Okay, so right now, oh, and let me go, let me go to my slide. Okay, so at this point in what I'm, I'm presenting, right? We, we would be using a Drush. Oh, by the way, I'm going to stick to basically um, Drush and, um, Yes, we're not, I'm not going to manually, uh, uh, we might look at a, um, a configuration file uh, ju just to see what's going on with the actual YAML file itself, but I'm not going to try and, and write those files. We're just going to use things like Drush to, to make all of this happen, right? But for me, um, right now, you would be using Drush config export because all we're on is core right now. But since I, I've preloaded some split stuff, some config split stuff, I'm going to be using Drush, Drush, oops, Drush config split export. Okay. So again, let me get out of this file. Okay. And push this down here. So, right. So here, here we are. I've got this configuration here. It's saved here on my screen and it's saved in my database. I would like it to now move to the upstream database. So, how do I do that? Okay, great, right? Switch over to my, my config directory, right? This is, the, this is the, 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 the code that is under version control. And we can see what the difference is, right? That there is in fact a slogan added. Okay, so we just add this. Okay. Push it. Okay, so now I go over to, oh, actually this could be larger, I think, and I can make this larger. I go over to, this was what I did on my local, right? I go over to my upstream site, right? Go to the same place, well, this is the place that I've designated, which, it, which is the same in this case, is the config directory. This would be a git pull. Okay. Oh. Okay, and we can see that that a new file that there was a change there was a change to one file. Okay, switch over to the actual site. Run. Okay, it's the same thing except we're running import now. Yeah, you know, I have to spell drush correctly, I think. Okay, and this and this this is the one. This is the one that you do the happy dance on, right? Because configuration is, is important successfully, and and the result is here on my upstream site. I now have that configuration change. 
Okay, so that's the core, that's the core system, okay? We're gonna look at some contrib modules that really round out the, the suite of, config, of configuration. Okay, again, I guess I'm still spelling, the, I'm still spelling, this, spelling that out, config, oh well. Configuration split. Okay, that's the first one we're gonna look at, right? Let me get that window open for us. So this is all pretty complicated reading. Right, so I so I thought one thing that I could do here would be just to, to just to 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 to, to put, not 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 to try to editorialize, but to make it as simple as possible. And again, for ADA purposes, I'll read this slide. The config split module works during importing and exporting configuration. The idea of the module is to have different configuration per environment. That is one set of configuration on local machines and another set of configuration on the upstream website. Okay, the canonical example of this is to have the devel module enabled and perhaps configured on local systems and not have the devel enabled on upstream websites. Okay, so, you know, it seems a little bit out of order. Oh, right, so I've preloaded a configuration split. I mean, I think this is all well and good with devel, but I'd like to show something else. And, and this is what I would like to show, which is, now, there we are. So basically I'm here again on my local system. This local system could be faster, right? And what I wanna show you is that because of this, the configuration split that I've set up, right? When I test my email system on my local system, it prints the email to the screen. That's done with um, a, a collection of modules, which I'll mention briefly, MailOg, Swift Mailer, and Mail System, right? When I do the same thing on my upstream system, Right when I go to send, it actually sends the email and then just quick proof of concept. Right here exactly is is the email that was just sent to me. Okay, so how, how did I make this happen? No code is involved. This is all just configuration. All right, so how, how do we start? We start by getting oh, getting the module right composer require Drupal config split can brush enable config split, right? Outside of the scope of this discussion to, to, to discuss Composer, um, but that's that's how we're getting modules these days. Uh, um, and, and then Drush enabling, hopefully that's 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 familiar to folks. Now, what I found, the, the, the way to sort of crack the code on this module is before you go any, before you set up your actual split, you need to get your environment set up, right? And where you get those set up are again in the, Yeah, can't, no, no memory there. In the settings file. Okay, so now this is when we want we want to look at we want to look at look at how we set how we're going to set up. You know, this is pre um, admin UI work. We're going to want to set up this all this stuff. Well, not all, but we want to set up this stuff. Right, so that when we go to create our configuration splits, they're recognized by the system. Okay, so what, what am I doing here, right? So starting off real simple, right? Creating an environment, an environment variable, which is, which is dependent on the host name. Okay, this, how you learn, right? You're adding this configuration, you're adding to the configuration array, how you learn config split, config split, Mm, that's something that you, you're going to need to know. I think there's some documentation on that. And then, of course, I beg your forgiveness because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm home and I'm not using Pantheon. So this should really be local, but this is actually what my host name is, right? Just as up there on Green Geeks, right? This is, this is what the host name is up there. Okay. So the way we, would, way we would address this type of code is we would start with it both false. Then we would use a simple switch case to check the environment, right? If we're on our, our local system, let's change the status to true. If we're on our upstream system, let's change the status to true. Okay, you also wanna do your directory structure, which I think I have a slide for. Yes, I do, no, oh yeah, oh, I can jump ahead, right? And so the directory structure looks, looks like this, right? We've got, we're looking at the settings PHP over here, right? In our config directory, which is our, our, our re, which is our repo, right? We're adding a split directory into which we add these two directories. These are actual directory names. I know they're a little bit awkward. This one should be local. Oops. 
this one should be local, this one should be devel or develop or something like that, or dev or something like that. But but the, the trick of this module is to is to get you is to get your names consistent and to get your names right. Okay. So then when you actually go to create your split, right, every, everything, everything works out for you, right? Because Right, so these, these splits are preloaded, right? And we can see that what I'm doing is since my environment is, my, is this local environment, whatever that was, LPUB 0035 or whatever that is, right? right this is now active. And then my upstream environment is, is, is inactive, right? So, okay, that's, that's about the configuration on the module. How did these rows get here? Of course, I added the configuration split, added the entity to, to the configuration split. Now let's look at what the configuration split actually contains, right? Again, the, the naming, you know, I went down this rabbit hole. Don't, don't, please don't scold me for underscores here and periods here. Once I got it ready, it was like, okay, this is a presentation. That's good enough, <laughs> right? And again, here, here's where we set up our, our folder. Okay, we, it, gets time, it gets time to actually add modules. And yeah, I'm going to keep Devel on my local only, but that's not really what, I'm, what I've demoed. What I've demoed is adding MailLog, MailSystem, SwiftMailer module to this local split, okay? And I think there was one other little thing here in the conditional. This is the sort of thing that you, you will work on. Uh, yeah, there it was, right? Add something to, to the conditional. This is the sort of thing that you, you will work on because what this is doing is it's pulling the, the, the module out of the core extension configuration and putting it into the split configuration. Okay, so the, you might not know what that means. What that means is, is, is let, me, let me back up on that for a second. You've got core extension, right? Is it core config? Yes, it's core extension, right? Core extension, which is, I think I have, I think we can, we can look a little bit at, yeah, no, we actually want to look at this one, right? And then, yeah, core extension. So this is, this is a very important file um, in your, in your Drupal system, right? This file is all the modules that will be enabled when you import configuration. Okay, so so what I'm doing, what what we're doing over here, right? What we're doing over here, excuse me, over here is I'm taking mail. This the system does this for you. I'm taking mail system colon zero out of here, and I'm putting it into the the you know the, into the module the the module as a module as a value of the module key on on the the configuration itself okay but again that's too much depth i think anyway this is all saved right it's all saved and you you can you can see how it works right we go up to my local system uh, oh yeah, so so the 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 tricky part, another tricky part about about this module is how do you get your initial setups working correctly? Now I'm on the upstream system, right? The dot com system, and we can see that yes, the local is overridden and and the the upstream is is active, right? Because you're not configuring the module in the config split, you're configuring the module to be a part of the config split. So like for instance, let's go let's go back one. No, right. I've added these modules right to my configuration split. Blah blah blah. These modules here. I still what I want to do now is I want to go into these modules, and I want to configure them for this particular environment, right? Because when I do my configuration export, it will capture that configuration in the split in 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 the YAML, right? And so so for instance, right, the, the, the thing it doesn't quite um, come out to apples to apples to apples on this one, but on my local, right, this is how come you saw, for all intents and purposes, this is why you saw um, the email print when I tested my email system, right? On the local system, whereas on the upstream system, you can see that this is checked. So this is actually allowing emails to be sent. It's not exactly that way, but, but for, for the sake, sake of this discussion, it, cer it certainly is, right? And so the, 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 one of the tricky parts, and I, I'll move on, right? One of the tricky parts is, is this part, is when is getting, these, getting the idea of 
I want to, now that I've got my split set up, now I want to configure my, do my configuration for this environment this way. Then I, then I switch environments and I do the configuration for, th for that environment that way, okay? We talked about not sending configuration downstream. This is one case where you might want to send configuration downstream. Okay, because like I said, I don't, I don't want to overwhelm, you know, overwhelm people by saying, yes, you, you could conceivably build this entire split. Oh, this split, the upstream split. You could basically build this, the, the upstream split by just, by just copying files in and, and adjusting them that way. But we want to keep using Drush. Okay, I showed that slide. Okay, so now get a, config ignore. Oh, I finally got the spelling right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is this is interesting. He's kind of selling something here. So this is sort of funny. He's a real good guy, Berger. Um, but but here, here, here's what I'm saying about it. Oops. The config ignore module works to prevent changes to configuration. Let's say that you would like the system site configuration to remain untouched on your live site, no matter what the configuration in the config folder is. Well, that could also say no matter what the configuration is on the site, right? And then just not, not, not as a criticism, but this is what he's describing. That's exactly what he's saying. This is verbatim, right? This is actually a config ignore added to the config split. I'll do my best to try and show that because that's currently not configured, right? Config ignore settings can be included in config splits, right? For instance, the site slogan can be changeable on local systems, but not on upstream systems. But before we get to that, let's let's look at the module a little bit more closely in any in any way, um, which is basically to go here and to go here and to go here. Okay. So on the local, let's say let's say we don't want the the system the, the the system site to be changed under any circumstances. So we would add it here. Okay, save. Okay, all right. So let's get out of this one. All right, let's go to this tab. Okay, back to Drupal. Let's see. Lazy, lazy programmer, export. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So I've exported a new configuration. Okay. Okay. So what this did was it 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 added this this configuration to to the the the, the config ignore settings. Not not all that exciting. It gets a little more exciting when we add the config ignore to the config split. All right, let's add it. Oh, actually, before I even do that, before I before I show it on the upstream system, now that I've added this here, should should I go back and for one reason or another, right? I changed this, right? This is the wrong slogan. Yeah, okay, this is an active configuration, but on my but even on my local system, right? Let's go back here. Do an do an input again, lazy programmer. Okay. Okay. Oh, right. All right, that's where it gets a little bit confusing. <coughs> I've told it on my local. That that you would ignore um, um, system sites. What I want what I want to be able to demonstrate is how this is this is on the upstream system. This is this is this is protected, but on the downstream system, it is not. Okay. May have already done that. Right. Okay. Okay. Import. There we are. Okay. So again, now, now, now this is this is this is protected on both on both sides, right? <coughs> this this won't change. This won't change. What I'm putting in here won't change when I do an import. Doesn't make so much difference on your local system, but it it does make a difference up here on the on the upstream system. For example. Oh, I did the import, right? 
So here we are. This, this will never change. Okay. So I think that, that that's, a, that's a clear enough example of what's going on. But what we really want to see is we really want to see um, this same thing only on the local system, right? You can change it as, as you please, right? But on the upstream system, you cannot change the site slogan. Okay, so now on the local system, I've, ta I've taken this away, but how am I gonna get there, right? Because now I'm only, I'm only dealing with, with this configuration, the configuration of uh, config ignore, I'm only dealing with that through the core extension, through, through the main sync directory. Well, the way, you, the way you deal with something like that, trivial though it may be, is you add config ignore to your split. Well, I guess I'm missing that window, right? I mean, that button, right? So we go here, config ignore, save, okay. Okay, back to this tab. Okay, nine. Here we are. We're going to do an export. Okay, and this is a little bit more interesting. Right, because you can see a number of things have changed now, right? What we're doing is fir first thing we did was we deleted this. We did, you know, the, the, um, um, the export deleted this file. Okay, but it, and it added the split. Oh, it mod it modified that. Oh, that's fine. Oh, right. It didn't it didn't change anything and it didn't change anything to that one yet. But it 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 added this one, the local, right? It added the it, it deleted the file from here, and it added it to the split on the local. Okay, and it also. Okay. Oh, that's fine too. That that's just that's we, we won't worry about that. What's happening here? Yeah, because the ignore is now out of the core extension because it's a part of the split. Okay, so let's commit all of this. Okay, over on this site, right? Let's go back to our oh, CLFIG. Okay. 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 Import. Okay. This is okay, right? But we're still not getting the answer that we want out of this, right? Because when we go over here to .com, right? We should probably see this is the wrong, oh, we do, we do not, right? That's, that's fine because of this, okay, configuration and ig ignore. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was going to be the hardest part to, to, to demonstrate. Okay. Yeah, because this is where we want this, right? We don't want things to change here. And this is where I'm going to break the rule about not sending configuration downstream. We don't want it here. Maybe this will simplify things, but we do, now let's do this, but we Right, and, and I know it sounds like I'm talking across purposes, right? We do want to be able to change the site slogan on our local system. We do not want to be able to change the system on our um, upstream system. So I've added it to the upstream system, right? Now what I'm gonna do is, is I'm going to add, I'm going to add config split to my upstream and again, once you get once you get these things, once you get the things set up, the um, the con oh config ignore is here. Oh, that's fine, right? Because yeah, 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 this is like I say, this was the hardest part to to demonstrate, but I, I think there's still some value in it. Now, what I'm going to be doing is right. Okay, I'm on my upstream system. Right, 
we can see that that I've modified this. I don't know what that's modified at. I don't really care. Um, because what we've done is I've added this, I've added the, the, yes, to the split, I've added the config ignore setting. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so again, like I said, I broke the rule. I'm sending some configuration down. So what I need to do here on my local system now is, is pull that in. Okay, back over to here. Well, I guess I spelled something wrong, right? Yep. T. And we'll get rid of that there. Good. All right. So let's see how, how did we do? Again, like I say, this takes a little bit of finessing. Here we are on our local system. Hopefully this remains empty. And it does. We look at it quickly over here on the upstream system. And here we have it. Okay. So now I can, can continue on, on what I'm trying to demo, which is that Basically, uh, let's look over here, right? Right, this switched back because I did an import, but now if I do this here, right? Okay, I export it. Where am I? Oh, I'm in the right place. Okay. Oh, nothing, nothing exported. Oh, yeah, it's a little hard. To, it's a little hard to demonstrate. the 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 idea is that oh, I'm on com and I did it in the wrong place. Yeah, it's a little hard. It gets a little confusing this part. So I might I might just leave it here. This is the one that I wanted wanted to write in the wrong slogan. Yeah. Okay. So now let me go back here. Yep. Okay. Do import. Very nice. Okay. There are no changes to import. Yay, I made it. Okay. Because now my 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 ignore is part of my split. Okay. Since and I'm and I'll move on and I'll move on quickly from here, right? Since the this is since since the I'm ignoring any changes to to the site any change any configuration changes to to the system site right nothing will change over right this came this came in incorrectly this came in incorrectly previously again this is this is this is the sort of this sort of you have to you have to work this part out right so let me do it again right so if i'm importing right in fact, let me show, no, no, we spent enough time here already. So let me just do that, All right? Right, no changes to import on my upstream system. This will never change, right? On my local, uh, on my local system, right? This can be changed to anything, right? Okay, because I'm ignoring it, but I think I think I've spent enough time here. I hope this wasn't too confusing. Like I said, I wanted to demonstrate what it means to actually add and ignore, to 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 to, to talk about config ignore, add ignore to a split, and have have the ignore behavior uh, produce different results in different environments. All right? Yeah, I set all that up. Did all that? Okay. This module config override. 
This is a very cool module. Okay, it's a little bit on the primitive side, but it does a really, really, or not primitive, unpolished, I should say, it does a really, really important thing. And that thing is, right, is, is by using config override, you can keep information out of the active configuration slash the database. This information, such as API keys, are still available during, during runtime. Oops. Okay. All right. So the caveats about this module has a couple of caveats, right? Um, uh, the, the Drupal 9 readiness uh, on this one is not so. Um, perhaps someone else can answer this, but when you don't have this uh, line in your um, um, info YAML, that's it, right? Bad things start to happen, right? You, you'll never get the module to load, right? Um, I tried installing it manually for this demonstration with in W9 with wget, but it broke the composer right away and then Drush broke and all oh, that was a rabbit hole. So I'm gonna demo, demo this in, in um, 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 Drupal 8, right? The same, the same thing uh, as, I, as I already gave you the heads up on this, Jake, I've got, the, I've got this patch, but again, what good, what good does this module do right, without um, config override. So let's have a look at what config override actually does, right? Okay, so there's no admin UI for config override. Fortunately, right, um, there is a UI for, for the config override message, right? So how do we get this set up? So let's go back and do another tweak to our, oh, and this, this time we wanna be in the D8 system, right? Okay, so right, we're going to want to add. Okay, all this stuff, all this stuff is unnecessary, as it turns out. I thought override had a dependency on on um, sync, but uh, uh, excuse me, on um, um, uh, not this stuff on um, config split, but it does not. The only line we're interested in is adding this override index to the config directories. Um, uh, um, um, array, okay, and also setting up setting up the directory structure because this module you manage manually, right? And I think this is, this is the problem with Drupal nine is to get this module working you need to get this Symphony library and the dot the dot env, okay? But but one, once you, once you're doing this right you're going to add the module and then then I, I believe this is the latest commit that's the one that we're we're currently using enable the two modules. Okay, again, this is, a, this is a tree view of what I'm talking about. We've got a D8 system, plus we've got a config eight system, right? And we'll get that, get that repo in front of us. Yeah, there we are. Okay. Great, okay. So basically we've got a D8 system plus a config D8. In the config D8, I set up an override, okay? That, that has, what we're gonna talk about is recapture, right? And then the split, we don't need to see the split here. And, and oh, and so what you're seeing in the config override system is you're seeing actually two recapture settings. Okay, and there's gonna be one in here. Okay, so this one, right? This is what we're gonna see on the website, right? We're not, we're not adding, this is, this is the configuration that gets added to the database, right? And by, by using this XXX or some, some, some other nonsensical thing, right? We, we would not have our API keys in the database, right? The API keys are, are here in the override file, which is, which is stored here, okay? These two lines have to do with con config override, or, or actually these three lines have to do with config override paths. Okay, so let's see how that plays out. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, I never know where that where that where that captcha is. Oh, I do it this way. Haha. <laughs> I should have made it. Should have made a note. Right. Oh. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, show all columns, let's try that. Okay, configure. Right, so this is the message you're getting from the um, uh, config override message module. And this is the configuration that you're inputting 
which, which is what's stored in the Drupal database, right? But when it comes time to actually use the recapture, the recapture will be there. That's what the module does, which is what makes it worthwhile, even though there are extra steps that you, that you need to go through and to understand in order to get this, this particular module working. Okay. All right, so the admin UI tools, I think we, ha we have to talk about these. Um, I don't think they're bad tools. I think they're actually quite good tools. And there are a couple of things that I, that I like. Um, I wouldn't necessarily use a full archive um, import. I don't really know what would happen. Probably not good things. But this is really, really cool. This one here, the single item. And I, and I actually use this frequently in my work, right? I don't know who remembers, but in views, uh, you, you had a way in a view to import the view right in the view player, you know, right in the view tab. I thought that was pretty great in Drupal 7. I thought that was a really great feature. Of course, now, you know, views is, is another entity in the Drupal 8 system. So there's no reason to, to maintain or even, even pretend to have that feature right in the view. But you have it here. Right. Let's say I'm in the middle of something and I'm working on a view on a develop system. Right. And then I have to go and do something else. And so the develop system gets rebuilt on a regular basis. Right. So I don't want to lose what I've already gotten on the view, but the view isn't exactly what I want. So I save that view configuration somewhere, probably probably my my Git branch. Right. I call up my Git branch. I grab a hold of that. Right. And I can just dump it right in here and it will up, it will update my view. This is also really handy if, if say, they can't wait for a deployment and they must have um, this change to the view right away. Working on views on a prod system can be very scary, right? Something can go wrong, bad things can happen. You have, you have a copy of your prod in your, in your develop or your test, right? You, you can work out the view there. You can grab the configuration out of this guy here, right? Which is a... Global site could be faster. You could grab it out of here, right? Here's a listing of all your views, right? You know, and and do do the import that way. So I find these two tools to be pretty pretty good. You know, pr pretty useful, right? Um, the full archive on the export we've we we used to use, but then our, our site grew too large and we ran into mem memory errors. And besides which, this doesn't really respect splits. From why should it? Because split is not a not part of the core. So we don't use this anymore for medium sites, particularly sites that are that are just using core configuration. This this could probably work in uh, to to a, to a workflow. So I'm not totally saying don't don't use this one. Um, and then last but not last and least, of course, is this synchronized page, which there, it's gotten a lot better since say Drupal 8.1 or 8.2 or whatever, right? But but it, it's still I'm I'm still not exactly sure what's going on with this, right? You know, you've got buttons and you've got pop-ups and you've got all sorts of things going on, right? You know, and you you can use it, but again, I prefer to use the Drush tools. It's it's enough for me to know that this is actually working. You know, this means that yeah, yeah, the fact that I'm 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 getting this, and the fact that I recognize what this change is. You know, I changed this is the wrong slogan to anything, and and the system is detecting it. That 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 tends to be enough. That's that's all I need out of this page. All right. And that's everything I have. Um, I imagine there are questions. I didn't stop for any of them. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Excellent, yeah. Questions, anyone? Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. Yep, uh, I would have one, one question. Could you perhaps quickly elaborate what's the exact difference between complete and conditional splits, which is something uh, which I still not completely, it's clear to me from my understanding when playing around with the, comp with the config splits was e.g. for using complete splits to exclude whole modules, blocks or views from other environments. But if content like slogans or site names like you described or config of certain settings, differing in between environments, mm -hmm. I've success successfully applied conditional splits. It worked for me, but I've not really understood the semantic difference in between the split types of the two. Mm -hmm. So when to apply which? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a great question. We're, we're lucky we don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we're just think we're just thinking about um, uh, the the entire module, 
you know, uh, we want everything, everything from that. There is a lot more happening on this page in terms of what you can configure. Um, I'm not, I'm not entirely, you know, I have, I, you know, I actually am, am doing this, the conditional split. I noticed that there was a difference in, in the actual mail system settings, right? No, I'm, not, I'm in the wrong, wrong repo, excuse me. Okay, this one. No, this is. Um, okay, let's just open this one, open the other one up. Okay, split this so we can see. So this was really just, just, from, just from observation, right? Oh, these look very similar, but I noticed on our system that there, that there was actually a difference between uh, what was happening in the mail systems. So, so I, and the mail system configuration, depending on the split. So I added that con conditional split, but yeah, it's a very good question. I'm not, you know, um, configuration items. This one is pretty self-explanatory, right? If you want it, you know, if you wanted to leave out this block or another block, you could just click that one. Go ahead. But does it mean basically if you say complete split, the YAML file for that particular config is completely left out for the other environments? And if you leave conditional split on, then the YAML file uh, is kept and written out. So you're able to modify certain parts of the config. So that is that the explanation for the yeah yeah I, I, functionality. yeah i see this explanation is so if you use the regular config split and you create a directory it'll move it'll copy the config files to your config split directory but not touch the sync directory so let's okay. say you had your local development settings and you config split them into a dev settings you'll still have that file sitting in the sync directory, like the no, core you, dot extensions. It won't no. delete them. No, you will not. No. It, it will actually. Yeah. What, and on so the config split complete, but the partial. Complete, oh, on partial. Oh, that's on right. On partial, it'll keep it. That's yes, really it, the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, yeah. no, actually, actually, and we're, we're all doing explanation here. Actually, it's not so, right? Because I'm doing a, con a conditional split on my, on the mail system settings, we see it's only in the splits now. The, the settings when you do the export, but it's not in the sync directory. Not in the, no longer in the sync directory. Oh, it's one or the other. Yeah. I, yeah. You know, it's fine. I mean, you know, like, like I say, that, you know, and 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 oh, I, one thing I forgot to I forgot to mention, like this is this is this is plain vanilla Drupal. There are over, you know, in in the um, the sync directory, there are over a hundred and seventy files in here. Sounds like a lot, not a lot, right? Big sites can have six thousand, ten thousand files, no problem. So, so yeah, so there, there's an, there's an, an answer that, that even though I'm adding conditional, I'm, I'm conditionally splitting the mail system settings because I observed a difference on, on our, our site, right? I'm conditionally splitting it. It is, it is also just doing that because we only see the mail system settings in the splits now, right? You, you all can read what I'm, what I'm seeing too, right? So, so yeah, so like I say, we're pretty lucky. I mean, I don't even know that I need to keep this, but I was working on a bigger project and I needed to, needed to get this working that, that I would print my emails in one place and, and I would send them in another place. And I couldn't, couldn't keep, you know, changing the configuration so the, the QA folks could do their manual testing. Couldn't do that. And we moved away from manual testing anyway at this point. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot more probably going on here, but I hope that answer, that helps answer your question by seeing yeah. this checkbox here and seeing what happened to that file. Yep, yep. That's clear, thank you. Erica, uh, I've got a question for you. Maybe, uh, maybe you already answered this. I was feeding my daughter. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't used configuration override before. Uh, what is the advantage of using configuration override uh, versus just directly overriding the configuration in settings.php? Um, good question. Very good question. Let's get, let's get, um, let's get that in front of us. Hmm. 
Yeah. Um, how, how I would answer that. So what you're saying, JD, is if, if I were to add an override here to say that, you know, that recapture, right? Oh, it might not work in runtime. Right. Remember what we're trying, what we're trying to do is I'm, I still want recapture to work. Let's see. I don't know where that tab is. You know, I still want recapture to work for me, but I don't want to save its configuration key in the database, in the active configuration. So I'm overriding yes, but I'm also making that um, uh, uh, API key and its secret key, of course, um, available during runtime. So recapture continues to function. I don't know if that would, would continue to be the same thing if I were simply to override the configuration here in the settings. Yeah, so I mean, when I'm dealing with like API key credentials and things like that, generally I will override it in settings.php based on the environment. Um, and the database will just have some dummy, dummy information in it. So I just, I, I'm just, I'm not really familiar with configuration override and whether it, I guess, provides some additional flexibility or best practice beyond that approach. Yeah, I, I, I think, I think if you're already doing it that way, I think that perhaps it, 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 um, it doesn't. I'll, I'll add it to my list of modules to not explore. Thank you. It, yeah, I don't know. I mean, my I, it's a great question. I think it's scale. If you have a ton of configure overriding, which I run into sometimes, I've got like 40 files that I just want in Git in like overridden and that it works better than writing into settings. But you're right for a few settings is a good point about settings. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe scale. Maybe that maybe that's that's a, that's an argument in favor. That makes sure. sense. Thank you both. Sure. Oh, and one last thing I, I will mention is there is a good argument for having a prod split. Um, that's, you know, um, you, do, you don't want more than one core extension on your system, right? If, you, if you've got more than one core extension, you've got, say, a core extension in your sync directory, a core extension in, in say, your local, your local split, not quite doing it, not quite doing it right. Nothing that we would change now, of course, but, but, um, uh, you wouldn't want to do that. You would you would want to add, you would want to work on your splits, right? So so then then there is which which makes a good argument for a prod split and a stage split and a test split and, and all of them. You know it it becomes a good a good tool. The the config split being the star of the of the modules here, right? Becomes a good tool to 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 really dig into because I I find it to be very you know it just it works great. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Sure. That was very good. I... <laughs> Thanks. That was the goal, right? I'm I'm sort of the evening the evening's entertainment. Just listen and kick back. <laughs> well, success. Great. All right. Let's uh, have some more success, uh, Jake. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. You're going to do a talk today on the web forms modules greatest hits and also do an ask me anything. Um, yep. Make sure you get the, the yeah, screen sure. here. I'll share my screen. Um, okay, let's get the right one desktop two. Um, I mean, there's a good segue from what Eric was talking about because web forms are configuration. And it's a huge challenge because a lot of people use web forms as content and they need them not being overwritten, they want someone to go to their site and make a change and not have it overwritten when they're importing config. So a lot of what Eric talked about is used to manage web form configuration. And I even have a dedicated blog post that kind of walks through similar stack that Eric talked about specific to web forms. And we can talk about anything. I think that's really the, the goal here. So first off, I got to ask the most important question. Everyone can see my screen, right? Good. That helps me to start. Now, what I also do is I'm going to move my screen. <gasps> Whoa. What did I do? Okay, I moved my screen and I messed up my doggle, but you can still see my screen. I can see it. I'm gonna start. What's important is I can see everyone here. Um, let me see if I can get the chat open. This is the problem. I can't get the chat open. I'm going to ask people to interrupt me and unmute themselves and ask questions during this presentation. I think it'll be fine. Unless you're incredibly shy, 
and I did get the chat up. And you can ask me questions in the chat and I'll explain how you could do that. By the way, I think I wanna use the Slack chat and I will read the questions. It's just easier because if I, not the Slack chat, I'm sorry, the Zoom chat, because it's easier for me to keep track of with Zoom open. So we've said hi in the chat. Um, give me a second. All right, so Webform's greatest hits. I'm gonna give a quick introduction. I started, my name's Jacob Rockwitz. I'm known as Jay Rockwitz on the web. I'm a Drupal developer and software architect. I built and maintained the Webform module for Drupal 8. This is a different spin from my typical presentation because once I started doing my web form presentations online, I realized it was one, there's a different, well, there's a different opportunity here. It's to engage people and answer their questions. And this presentation is different because I decided to break it down into smaller segments like songs. That's why I'm using this album metaphor. And each segment has a theme. At the end of each segment, it ends with a QA. and a And for large audiences, I tell people to throw the questions in the chat with a capital Q. Here, people can unmute and ask a question, and I'll answer it. And yeah, my goal, this is all that I'm after, is to answer your questions. I don't care if I don't get through this entire deck. If I show something and someone has a question about it, I'll do it. Lots of people have seen web form presentations of mine before, and they might want to ask a very detailed question. Um, I am going to focus on new features more than old features. If someone hasn't used the Webform module and I gloss over something, tell me to go back to it. Yeah, this is switching over to choose your own Webform adventure. I think that's gonna be the next presentation I work on for DrupalCon where it's gonna let the audience decide how this should navigate and go. But for now, I have 10 segments. And the first five kind of start off with general Webform stuff, just building forms, configuration, elements, handlers. And this last five is, Specific functionality that people ask a lot of questions about that I'll just walk through, conditional logic, spam, headless, security and support. And I even have extra tracks that I've thought about. And if you have questions about these things, you can ask them during the presentation and I'll, I'll talk about them. I only have slides about tokens, but sometimes people ask me about access controls or PDF generation. And I'll go, I'll go back to them as we move through. And oop, it skipped the first one. So we've got to just talk about the form builder. This is kind of just to get people started on the same page. And the song for the form builder is, I'm not pretty, but I'm powerful. And the form builder just provides for the web form module, a simple UI for creating forms. It's fully accessible via keyboard and screen readers to all users. I like including this bullet point because it really emphasizes the accessibility of the web form module in Drupal. It's not just the forms that are built, it's the admin UI you can use with a keyboard. There's no traps voice application, you know, um, screen readers work with it. And for developers, I like having the last bullet to just be like, you can edit and see the source code behind a web form. And it's a very powerful feature. And it's what I like to demo. So I'm gonna go over to clean install the web form module. And I like to use this contact form as the demo. And I, anyone who's seen the presentation, I've stuck with this one because it really is the best way to say, here's a contact form. I would like to add a company element to it. So I hit add element, we're in the form builder and I select text field. And I say company. And hit save. Adds it to the bottom, we could view it. And the mistake here is it should be up under you your name and probably, and be called your company. And you can do this all in the UI, but it's a great opportunity to just switch over to the source mode. And this is the source code behind the form. It's using Drupal's form API to display the render array as YAML. I know it's a little technical for, for and what it allows you to do is cut and paste elements, create your own. And what I would like to do is copy the required property. I've changed the label. I've altered the form a little and this also provides another opportunity, instead of going to the view tab, I'm going to the test tab, and it just fills out the form. So we get nice dummy data, and you can see your company, it's required, it's working, and I'm gonna hit send, and we've created a single submission with a confirmation. And this is the form builder. And I'm gonna keep going. And there's some tips and tricks I'd like to throw out there. For, for really complex forms with long questions, where you might have a question where, you know, I don't know, what's your favorite color? 
you can add admin titles that then in the admin UI, it doesn't display the full text of the question. It just, just displays a simple label like color. And developers should know how to use that YAML source mode. It enables you to write forms and build forms really quickly. Conversely, it's a permission to access that YAML source mode and don't allow untrusted or non-technical users to access the YAML source. It's not worth it. Um, are there any questions? It's okay if there's not. I kind of understand that. Um, what I, oh, go for it. Interface um, is, uh, the source code is right there. Is that what you're saying? I haven't looked at the Drupal 8. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think you're asking a really question. You're coming from Drupal 7, and it's a completely new code base and approach to building forms. So yeah, no, I, I do understand that. I have been working with yeah. it. I mean, it's uh, what you just showed, uh, uh, the, um, you know, just put, build your own uh, form using the form API. Is this part of the the front end GUI uh, for yep. the web? So that's yes. cool. That's what I was wondering. In other words, yep. so you would use this because it's just quicker, so you can just create your own instead of going through the the WYSIWYG kind of thing with the web form. Yeah, mm -hmm. it much faster. Okay. You can copy that's segments that's over. Yeah. Yeah. If you know Form API, also just this is a good gateway. I'm if not you that want loud with that in the seven Form API, so very yeah. similar. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes there's little nuances here that you could do only in the source mode and there'll be a recipe for that. If it's really advanced functionality or you're customizing something. But in the UI that you're seeing, you can adjust everything. And I, I'm gonna spend a second on that to just kind of, I like demoing admin tile because there's a new feature that I included with it. So in the advanced tab, we're on the name field and I, we probably don't wanna show your name throughout the whole UI. So you can change it to name, but you can also say, this is a note and add notes to the UI. And I am using this on these really complex forms I'm building. And it allows me to add a note to everyone coming in, do not edit this element or you'll break this application. Um, and it's a feature that was added about a month ago. I'll keep going and feel free to ask more questions. Jake, I got, I got a question for you. you I want I questions. I, I, have to admit, I, I, haven't, I haven't used WebForm in a while. Um, and you mentioned, you know, the web form is configuration, yeah. right? Um, you know, the standard kind of best practice now is you don't edit configuration on your live site, yeah. right? It really comes, comes, you know, from downstream. So how do you reconcile that with, I guess, the desire and need for site builders, maybe uh, end users, customers right on the website to actually construct web forms without having to go through a whole deployment pipeline. I mean what the the recipe is you use config ignore and people use that for blocks and web forms are the big culprits of that problem. And wholesale you just ignore any changes to blocks and web forms and then no one can edit them. And since you know getting a little technical we use that workflow but then we also in our update hooks if we need to update a web form via configuration we have a little update hook that does a minor config import of just the web form. It just updates the single web form. Um, and I, if you look up, if you write, do a Google for web form configuration management, there's a blog post that kind of walks through the recipe because it was, it's been a question that's come up over and over again. Um, the perk, I do want to emphasize when people ask that question, the big perk of it being configuration is if you run into a bug, you can click export here and download this whole file of your bug and send it to me in the issue queue. It makes it incredibly easy. And you can move your forms from one place to another really e So most people are working on production, but sometimes they wanna to go to a dev server and muck around, and then they can just import the form. Now, Jacob, we actually though build forms on the fly based on MongoDB key values on the keys. Which is that's, really which is why I love this thing. I mean, yeah, that I've seen. That's what Civi CRM is doing as well. They're basically they've created a module where they go into a table table and say, "I want to pull these fields out," and it generates a web form for Civi CRM data on the fly. I mean, they, that pattern they've done for years, so they've got it pretty refined. All right, I'll keep going, and we can move. I, I'm going to actually move faster so that we can get through some things and then go through back to others. So. 
I've done the form builder and now we've created a submission and we're talking about submission management, showing me the data. And I think it's just important that you can, everyone know you can customize the, the submission table, decide what columns are displayed. You can control, each reviewer can have their own display of the submission data. Submissions can be flagged and locked, which starts setting up some workflow and you can export those results. And ultimately for developers, if you don't like what you can see, you can replace it with a view and views give you full control over the data. And the demo is fairly simple because we were just created a record. And I'm gonna go do one other thing in the test tab. I have the develop module on, I'm gonna create 50 records. It makes the demo a little nicer. So now I'm on the results submission table. So I click test, I went to generate, I generated 50, I got here and I've got my results table. And when I talk about, you can do some minor filtering. And if I talk about customizing, what I generally like to do when I customize a table is just display the data coming in, not all the extra metadata. And at the bottom, if you check this box, each user coming into this table can customize it for themselves. Right now, when I make this change, any user coming in will see just this simple table. I did accidentally, not a big deal, is remove the lock. Well, lock notes and star. Uh, you know what, we can leave them at the end. And these are those little flags that you can kind of, this helps with a workflow because you could say this is important. Or if you're done reviewing this submission, you could say it's locked and locked means no one can edit it. Um, finally, well, two things I'm gonna go to is you can view submissions in here. I like this advanced feature. You can download a submission as a PDF so we can create a quick PDF and this is just the default template but you have full control over this PDF and can get it stylized any way you want. I also like demoing this because then I can go back up to the results tab and go to download. And for the demo, I say, hey, let's generate an HTML table. Let's not open it in Excel and let me show it to you on screen. You can control every aspect of the export, what columns, how they're structured. This is just showing you You've got a nice table. This opens in Excel and you can manipulate the, da the data there. Since I showed you the PDF download, I also want to point, you can go and select download documents as a PDF and it will generate PDFs for every single submission. It is a great way to archive a web form. So you have records that you can go back to. I actually would do both. I'd create a spreadsheet and the PDF download because the PDF downloads like the canonical record. It's actually like, a document you could use as someone said, what did I submit to you years ago? I'm going to keep going. I really wanna talk about the add-ons and, and yes, the Webform Views integration has a Webform Views module. There's also the Webform Views token field, which all it does is make it possible to take Webform tokens and insert them into a view. And it, it's very lightweight and a simple solution. And for developers, if you wanna query the data in the database, there's the web form query module, which gives you a little API that makes it a little easier to query submission data. If you wanna generate custom reports or exports and things like that. Any questions? I don't have any cool tricks for submissions. Is there any I'm... reason why you would wanna use uh, your uh, querying the database as opposed to just you know doing using views to create the uh, no, just, well, just... yeah, um, one thing to say, and it's hard to go too far into it, but, you know, in all web form for Drupal 7 and 8, the web form submission data is not stored as field API. It's stored in a certain type of table. It's called an entity, entity attribute value table. So there's some limitations on the types of queries you can make in views. Yeah, I think sometimes, yeah, sometimes you wanted to go straight to the data. I've been using the entity form API very much with Drupal 7, and there was, I, I can't remember the reason why I, I got away from web form, but I do know it was because um, it allowed me to do a lot more. So it sounds like the web form 8 is really come along. It's come along with functionality, but you still have that. If you want to leverage entity stuff, mm -hmm. you would want to use the contact module that comes with core and Drupal 8 combined with the contact storage and you get some flexibility there. Um, there's also, people ask this question and this kind of leads to a good, there's something called the content creator web form add-on and I can go to it. And if I do search for content, I'll go to the module. Oh, 
content creator. I can open a new tab. Well, I'll let it go here. This module, what it does is it allows you to collect web form submissions and then generate nodes. And this is a best of both worlds scenario because you're getting like, the example would be you might have a web form that is 200 elements that you're collecting. You don't really want to create a node with 200 fields, but you want 40 of those fields to go, 40 of those elements to go into a node. You can do that. And then once it's nodes, you get all the flexibility of the node system. This really opens up a lot of possibilities here. Um, I, I'm really happy someone took the time to create this. All right, keep going. Configuration settings. I'm gonna go through this quickly because anything and everything can change. And that's the key thing with configuration settings, the webflow module. You can change any label, behavior, you can disable elements, handlers, even libraries and you can configure third-party settings. The two examples would be the PDF generation. There's little tweaks you can make to that. You can add a header and footer. And if you're using spam modules, you can configure how you want the spam module to protect your web forms. And the demo, I think the important concept that people need to know is there's configuration and settings. Configuration is global. So when I go over to the configuration tab, I have configuration for all my web forms. I can turn on, and by the way, this little claps all helps a lot because it makes it easy. You should walk through everything, but I could turn on Ajax for all web forms and I could decide how that Ajax will work for all web forms. I can set the custom labels and descriptions for the confirmation message. This is the default one and you could change it if you don't like it. An important thing to take away is you can at a global level, turn on and off elements. I strongly recommend this. Most elements are turned on by default, but for, for example, the password element is turned off. And if I turn it on, it'll tell you why. That password is stored as plain text in the database, therefore it's not considered secure. Don't recommend using it. But there are use cases where someone might want a password element because they're using some third party integration. If you don't need to support file uploads, turn them off. Um, I like in this demo, since we're just talking about web forms configuration and, you know, uh, JD, you brought up that most people are editing, are building web forms on production. It's a little weird that web forms is nested under structure. And there's this little tool that was added recently where you check off this box, display web forms as a top level menu item in the toolbar. And for sites, we have a lot of people building web forms as content. This is a good compromise because what it does is it takes web forms and moves it up to its own bucket and they can manage it there. There was no opportunity to tuck it under content because this UI doesn't really support web forms properly because it's a tabbed user interface and web forms has its own tabs. But this is really useful moving around because you can get to forms, submissions and templates really quickly. Um, anyway. From there, I just want to emphasize settings are specific to a web form. So if I go back to forms, I go to my, my contact form, you go to settings, and this is where you can control all the behaviors. And if I had turned on Ajax, this would be disabled and say Ajax is enabled for all forms. And for each form, you can adjust. There's a ton of settings here. I don't even, it's like impossible to go through everything in one session. Um, Keep it simple. I think that's important. I just showed you a lot of stuff. Use the defaults whenever possible. You don't need to go start tweaking everything. At the same time, disable unneeded functionality. Disable the elements you don't need. If you don't need an exporter or a handler, turn them off. And a little developer trick is if you don't like how a new web form, when you create a new web form, the settings are, you can use a hook to change those settings. So when someone does web form create, you can go in and tweak some of those default settings. Any questions about configuration and settings? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Elements, this is an important one. Every question matters, that's what forms are about. And there's an example module that shows this, has a style guide and it shows you the kitchen sink of every element. It lets you play with them, understand how to configure them a little bit. It also helps your front end designers to see what, how things are gonna work. And you can use this just to get a grasp of what's possible. And I'm just showing you the signature element, the cute kittens, you know, terms of service, entity references, 
composites, which I'll talk about in a second. And finally, there's even examples of just the styles, like how messages are going to look or multiple flexbox columns work. And just recommend, you know, setting up the style guide. You can copy and create your own style guide for your own project. And now what I'm doing is I'm just zooming in on one single element with every single possible title, placeholder, description, and help text turned on. And I'm just showing you the flexibility here. And you can configure all of this. I don't recommend doing what you see on screen right now. Each one of these types of labeling has its own use case. For example, I use the tooltip heavily in the web form module UI because I'm trying to save space. And I know people are going to come back to the form. And if they really need help, they can go over the tooltip. And it, it, it works really well. Generally, you should go with the description. This is a description just right below the input is the best, best practice. But if you have really a lot of text you need to display to someone, for example, I do healthcare forms. I need to say, what is a PSA? And that's, a, I think, a prostate antigen. And the explanation is two paragraphs. And the read more helps a lot. Because you could say, learn more about a PSA. And it slides out to two paragraphs of text that someone could read. They can click on links. You can embed tables. Um, it just depends on your use case. Now I'm just getting some examples of really cool, awesome elements. This is a computed twig element. It's doing calculations. The example is doing calculations on the fly with Ajax. I'm going to the back end, and basically you add these, and you can go and define the twig. And this twig is very simple. It's adding two numbers together, A and B, checking off Ajax, and it's going to, on the fly, when someone starts filling out the form, it'll do a calculation. These are tokens. So it's a way to grab additional data. So I have an entity reference to a user. And those extra fields are just grabbing some extra user information and embedding it in the form. So it's besides just getting the user ID, I'm getting their email, their full name. And this can then be pushed into the submission. Composites are multiple elements working together. The examples that are best is contact information, a person, an address. And it just makes it easier to build things like an event registration form. And you can build your own custom composites. You can even build your own custom option elements. These are like web components where you define the HTML markup, the CSS, and you can even define default options. But then there's a preview tab. And all this is doing is generating buttons. And these are reusable throughout your site. The better example is going to be this map of the United States. So SVG, which is a standard, is markup. And so basically, this is linking to an SVG file that has an ID and title attribute. And it allows us to create a clickable map of the United States. And this is fully accessible. Um, I'm using it for medical diagrams. I've seen people use it for event registration, where people need to book tables. Um, and it's worth checking out, and there's you know examples with the module. These are all sub modules, so you have to look at the list of web form modules, and there's an options custom options module. So I think you're starting to get the point that every aspect of an element is customizable. Recommend starting out with basic elements. The caveat about those great computed elements with AJAX is you need to use them sparingly because they're doing calculations on the fly on the server. And people have ran into performance bottlenecks because they're doing 20, like 10 AJAX elements that are calculating at the same time. And for developers, there are examples of how to put elements in code. And that provides you with the most flexibility and stability because you can get your custom element into your Git repository. And you can even do little nuanced behaviors to it. Any questions about elements? I don't have, oh, do I have any? This is my one challenge. It's the end of the day. I don't have like witty tips and tricks for elements. Um, Jake, what's, a, what's a, a missing element that you'd like to see developed? Oh, God. It's only one. <laughs> I've done a lot of work. It's, it's, it's a cascading options element. It's that use case where you're trying to, like someone's trying to buy a car, and you have a drop-down menu that they select the brand of car, and then when they select the brand of car, it goes into the individual models of cars. And how to get that, there is a module um, that's called like the uh, web form hierarchical, simple hierarchical select module. And what it does is it uses taxonomy. 
So you build that hierarchy and taxonomy and it'll display it to the end user. And that's a nice pattern, but it would be nice to get that working powered by like a spreadsheet or an API. And I have, I don't think I'm going to get around to that one, but it's, it's like literally on my like to-do list and it's, it's come up over and over again. There are workarounds. You can use conditional logic to fake it. Um, but that's, yeah, that's the one that's missing for me. Ah, web form handlers. So we've talked about building forms, elements, and handlers just about every action. Submitting a form should have a reaction and you need to do something with it. And I think people understand sending an email. Um, you can even schedule an email. So if you do an event registration system, you could say, don't send the email immediately when they fill it out, send it one day before the event as a reminder. You can take that data that they're submitting and remote post it to a third party server. Um, I'm, I'm gonna demo that a little later if I have some time. And then actions and settings are really important to think about. What th that does, that's where you could start creating workflows. So an action would be someone makes a submission and you apply some conditional logic. And let's say you wanna flag the submission. You can use that handler to flag a submission or lock it or add a note to the submission. Um, and it's usually use these with conditional logic because you're trying to react. Someone's entered a certain value and you want to apply an action. Um, settings, so actions happen on submissions. Settings happen on web forms. And it's the other side of this challenge. What if based on what someone entered, you want to change the confirmation message or the URL that they're redirected to? You can just say, well, I want to change this web form settings based on this condition. Let's say you, they're filling out a feedback form and they say it's an issue with the website. Well, maybe you want to say, I'll re I'm going to respond to you in 24 hours. You can use the settings handler to do that type of behavior. And you can change almost any aspect of how web form is going to work. People use it for the confirmation message mostly. Finally, there's the debug handler, which is automatically there. It just shows you the data, shows you what's going on. And every one of these other handlers I've shown, mentioned here has a debug setting in the advanced, a checkbox in the advanced tab, which does a similar thing. It just tells you what's happening. So in the email one, it shows you the email that's going out. It tells you who it's going to go to. Um, and this is just walking through adding handlers. It's a tab. I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly in this. It just shows you all the handlers. You click add, you enter your settings hit save. I'm showing the, the scheduled email handler because it just shows kind of this nice feature where you can say, well, do it, you know, send the email on the date the submission was created or after it. And you can adjust that. You say send it one day after it was created if you want to send a reminder. Yeah, enable debugging on your handlers to know what's happening. If you run into issues, just turn it on and you'll probably be able to figure out the problem. Now, if you write your own handlers, the plugin allows you to act on the form, the web form, and the entity that's being saved. So the web form would be, you know, validate data, or when some submitting data, you can manipulate it. At the same time, handlers will act on entities. So someone submits a form, it's validated, goes to the submission process, and then that submission is saved. You can also, in your handler code, kind of manipulate entities the same as you would do with hooks. What's nice is it puts it all in one place. So you have a single handler handling all these behaviors. I hinted at it, handler support conditional logic. It opens up a lot of flexibility. And yeah, just to make sure you know this, they're, they're extendable plugins. So if you don't like how the email handler is working, you could create your own or extend the one that's there and tweak it. Any questions about handlers? It's hard because most people don't get to this until they start building web forms. Ah. We'll go to conditional logic. And I think I've just hinted that this exists. And conditional logic is just all about when you have forms, you want to, besides with handlers, you want to be able to ask the right question at the right time. And conditional logic allows you to do that. And there's kind of two types of ways to do conditional logic. There's conditional logic and variance. And both of them allow you to tweak a form based on submission data. So someone enters a value, you're tweaking how the form works. Conditional logic allows you to hide and show or require elements, variants are a little more powerful in the sense of like, someone's coming into a forum, they're giving you data. They're saying, well, my example would be, uh, I know a user's coming from a company, company A. I can change that form's labels to talk to just company A employees. I can say, welcome company A. 
because I'm giving them a little dedicated URL and I'm just tweaking, I'm making a variant of that web form. And I'll get into variants, but first I just want to just say what can like quick demo of conditional logic. The, the best, the, so there's a web form templates module and it allows you to create templates where people can go here and say, I want to build a contact us form. And they, it's literally a copy of a form. There is an example of a medical request appointment. And if I hit preview, this is a good example of conditional logic because it's showing you that on this request form, I could be the patient or the caregiver and it's changing the form fields. It's hiding and showing. And I'm hiding and showing this dropdown on what is the relationship and I'm changing this patient information is being hidden or shown. Well, really when you go to caregiver, it's asking what's your information and then patient information is shown. And we can even go in to the form. Oh, I'm gonna leave the site because there's a little protection on that form. I'll just show you the back end conditional logic. It's not, shouldn't be scary to anyone. So you can go in and say whether an element's visible or required based on who are you and if the value is a caregiver. Um, I'm gonna keep going. Oh, it popped me out, I'm back. Always start with conditional logic. It's based on something called Pound Drupal States API. Pound States API is the best way to search for it. And that means you could build your own conditions and code and create really advanced conditions if you start to understand it. In that demo, I was doing another practice of use containers to group related elements and conditional logic to hide that container. So that's how I'm hiding all the caregiver information on that form, because there's it's a dedicated container and I'm applying the conditional logic only to that container. Now to kind of introduce variants, it's a gradual thing you'll get to and implement. But I gotta give you a definition. So a web form variant is an alternate instance of a web form that adjusts settings, elements, or behaviors to yield a better result. It's a little more advanced than conditional logic because it's more than just hiding and showing elements. And the yield a better result, well, the simple example is A and B, A, A, B testing. So you can have a form and wanna see if an A version or B version. The A version here is a compressed version of a feedback form. And if I go over to variants and I click on the B, it's going to be a more verbose version. For example, you just saw that I changed the select menu to radio buttons. And that's how powerful variants are. You can tweak the actual source code behind the form. You could change the labeling. You can change any aspect of these variants. Um, it, it also, so there's, there's three use cases for variants. A-B testing is a very simple one. Segmentation is the other one. Segmentation I'm using for a form that needs to be available to 100 different companies. And the only thing that needs to change on the form is high company A, company B, company C, and a phone number. And you don't want to create 100 forms for each individual company. So I have one form but then I have a hundred variants and it's literally just a table. It's as simple as a hammer. You go and say, I'd like to add company A, here's the phone number. And it's important to note that variants can support unlimited variations with no performance implications. So for the hundred different organizations, it works perfectly. Um, you can also target audience. You could have a form dedicated to just patients and just caregivers. That would be a whole different way to approach a medical appointment form. And finally, you know, you can write your own variant plugins. They give you a lot of flexibility and it also opens up the door to personalization of your web forms. You could in theory use a variant to grab, if you know a user's logged in, you can change the entire form based on their user information. You can customize it just for them. Any questions about conditional logic or variants? This is a big one. Okay. okay keep going. Everyone asks questions about this. Spam protection comes up. Does the web form provide spam protection? Well, the first problem of the song is stop sending me your junk. These are the three spam protection modules that I recommend exploring. Um, they work in different ways. Honeypot puts a hidden field that if it's not detected properly, it'll assume you're a bot. Antibot uses JavaScript, assuming most bots aren't using JavaScript to submit a form. And it's true, most bots don't, so it blocks a bot from submitting the form. Captchas from, um, will ask a, a question to the user and they have to answer it. And 
in the add-on section, you can find more about spam protection modules. You go to, you can go, there's a dedicated group doing a search on spam. It's not actually showing you everything, but it gives you a list of other options because there's also Clean Talk, which is a service that reads the data being submitted and sees if it's spam. Now there is a big tip and trick for this. First off, Captcha works the best, but it's the most annoying and it has a huge downside. I'll get to that in a second. Honeypot can be good enough without annoying users. The big caveat is spam protection modules may disable page caching. Captcha 100% disables page caching. The reason is you have to ask the user a unique question. Therefore, the page can't be cached and Captcha breaks that. Honeypot has two options, the hidden field or time limit. If you add a time limit to a form, that also disables page caching because you need to know exactly when the page is rendered so you can count for the user and track the session. If you have a hidden field, it's okay. And this leads to a, 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 a recipe. And the recipe is honeypot and antipot. And with honeypot, you're just enabling the hidden field and antipot is applying the JavaScript. And the JavaScript is not, doesn't break the cache because it's just a little snippet of JavaScript. It's not unique for every user. And I've used this on a few forums and it succeeded in blocking spam without breaking page caching. When I say breaking page caching, it means you're taking a performance hit on your anonymous forums. And it's a big one. Um, any questions about spam? Anyone have any other experiences? All righty, I'm taking a sip of water. By the way, where are we at time? Because I don't want to make people feel like they have to stay too late. I mean, I, all right, I like the thumbs up. Search, search for my unmute button. Well, You're doing see. good. We're at, we're at um, yeah, take another five. So, yep. I don't know, Jake, what do you think? Another, another 20 minutes, 15 minutes? No, let's say aim for 10. And we could talk, we'll have 10 to talk more. Um, look, mm. this is about, Securing your submission data. I think it's important. This is don't trust anyone. I don't trust you. I don't trust anyone. And you should think about that with your forms when you're building them. And there's a couple of options here with securing your submission data. You can encrypt that data. You can actually disable the saving of submission data. If you have a contact form that's just sending an email, maybe you don't need to store that data in Drupal. You maybe just want to send the email. That remote post handler can take that data and put it to a CRM and never have that data stored in Drupal. The another option, which is very common, is people will have a web form submitted, post it to a CRM, and still store the data in Drupal as a backup for a week, and they turn on the schedule purging, which is a built-in feature of submissions. So it'll take that, it'll delete submissions after a week, they're a week old, and the assumption is that's gotten over to your CRM. And that is a good way to protect patient, I say patient, it's a good way to protect data. One of the standards is you don't want to hold on, you want to hold on data as long as you need it. Um, and a little note with submission data is you can define user submission access control. So you have very fine grained control over who can access what data, and you can even deal with GDPR and allow users to delete their own data. And there's a demo for remote posts, and I think I can go through it incredibly quickly by just saying, this is how it works. I'm on my contact form. I'm going to go over to the build tab. For the demo, I like disabling the submissions, but I'm just going to show the setting because we have some data in here. You go into general settings, you say, I don't want to save this submission. It won't store this submission and it'll actually work, but since I have 50 submissions, we'll still see the results tab. But if I go over to handlers and I add the remote post handler, and I'm going to give it a URL that's a broken URL, and this is why you always want to turn on the debug. I'm turning on debugging, and I go over to my test tab and I click submit and it's a bad URL. Because I have the debug, it's gonna show you what's going on under the hood. And it basically shows you the raw data going out and what the response was, which is a 404 because it was a bad URL. And if you had a good URL and it gave you a JSON packet, it'll even give you some tips on how to take that JSON packet's data and put it into a token and insert that back into your database if you were storing the data in the database. I like this demo because it's really important. I think this pattern for enterprise sites 
is very important. I am more and more lean toward recommending not storing submission data in Drupal, especially if you have a CRM or some other data platform that's meant to handle user data. I'm gonna keep going and leave the questions at the end. This is a new feature and a lot of people are just not aware of it because you do have to turn on a module. You can now distribute your web forms to external websites and it's, I want to share my web forms. I built a great form in Drupal. I have another site. It's not Drupal. I want them to use it. One approach is you do use headless and there's some add-ons to that. It is a common pattern. People are moving headless. Um, my note there is you lose a lot of functionality when you go headless because you have to recreate the front end of the form. This is kind of my recommendation. And I actually, instead, I want to demo it. And it's fairly easy to demo. I have the share module turned on. And if I go over to settings, I'm going to collapse this. So the web form share module is enabled. That doesn't mean your forms are automatically shared. You have to say which forms you want to share. So I'm going to say, you can go globally. By the way, that's in configuration. You can say share all web forms. But I'm going to form enable form sharing. And if I had web form notes, which I didn't go farther into, but you can do that for there. You can also add some custom attributes to the form that's rendered. And I'm going to show it to you. You can change the theme. So let's say I like Claro, which is good because I'm using the seven theme. I've done it. I now get this share tab. And what it's giving you is the snippet of code. There's three ways to embed. You can get a JavaScript snippet, which is the best way. You can get a resizable iframe snippet or fixed iframe. Don't recommend the fixed. The preview is showing what's going to happen. It's going to drop an iframe on your site and give you a completely embedded instance of the form that's fully integrated. It resizes. When you hit submit, the confirmation message is displayed in line and the page reduces in size. It's the same as you would share with any enterprise form builder. Um, you can even test that form. I like this feature. So you can just make sure that the workflow is OK. And in this case, I haven't configured this great because it redirects to the home page. If you did not want that shared embedded form to not redirect, you put an inline confirmation message. Yeah, I just the caveats are the headless can't support most advanced functionality. Sharing web form provides the most reliable external user experience. And yeah, that dedicated theme is really powerful. Because what I recommend for most sites is you'd create a dedicated theme for, theme for sharing your forms. And it's a very lightweight theme because it's just styling forms. And it reduces the overhead of that shared form because it's not loading the entire CSS of your website. So someone's just embedding a simple, a very simple page in an iframe. I'm going to keep going. It's always important to talk about getting help. This is the only reference to the Beatles. Please, please help me. And you know, there's documentation online. You can reach me on Drupal, you know, well, Drupal answers. You can ask questions and the whole community will help you. You can also reach out on the issue queue if you run into bugs and problems. And yeah, I didn't get into this, but there's videos about every single web form feature. And for example, this is just showing you how to do the views integration. So if you had a question, you can watch this video and it'll walk through doing web forms for use integration. You can get involved, report, or fix a bug, request or build a feature, write, or edit documentation. Sponsor a feature. We are at the end. You can learn more about me at jrockwoods.com. I, I added this slide. We could talk for a second. I, I felt like I needed to share this with the Drupal community. This is, well, no, the Drupal NYC community. This is a very tricky slide for me to end on. Um, <laughs> Maybe, I, I mean, we've asked, talked a lot of questions, so I'm going to talk about this slide. Um, it's very personal. So there's a lot of people in this meetup that I've talked to for years and worked with them. And my life, I said to JD, I was like, I like your smiling picture. It's fine that you're feeding your kid. But like, oh, my life is exhausting. And I am juggling three things right now, and it's wearing me out. And I figured I'd share with the community that it's going on is that, you know, I'm getting a puppy literally by Friday. I'm picking him up. His name is Oz. And he's going to consume a lot of my time. I won't be able to wake up early in the morning and work on web form issues. And professionally, my main client is moving to Sitecore. And that's next year. 
and we're doing a migration from Drupal to Sitecore. So it's going to spread me very thin. With this said, I'm sharing with the community so when you don't see me at the meetups, you're not surprised. At the same time, I'm committed to supporting the Web4 module and I actually don't know how my work is going to unfold. At the same time, I, I think I'll make a very, and I'm gonna write blog posts about it. And first blog post would be like, I gotta take care of puppy and I don't have a lot of time for Web4 module, which I think is a fair statement to the community. And then the second one is, yeah, this is the reality. Like my work is shifting and I've got to, you know, go with the flow. It's what pays my bills and figure out how I can keep supporting the web form module. But I, I think with open source, it's fine to pull back and be like, I'm only providing support for the web form module and I'm not, you know, doing anything else. Figured I needed to share that. Um, I'm not sharing it with, at large with the entire community. I don't. There's some people here who talk to a lot of people in the community. I'd rather we don't just, this doesn't leave this group right now. I will talk about it. At the same time, what I'm trying to do is do something that I've seen people not do. When they have changes happening in the community and they're leaving or maybe they're leaving or whatever, they don't talk about it. And then it creates a whole, what happened to that person? And I'd rather be more upfront about it. Um, and I will be upfront about it over the next year. And this was the first place I was gonna talk about it. Anyway, I'm going to skip this over and say questions. Are there any, and by the way, I just opened up some personal stuff. So it's a good time to, and you could ask the question, are you still going to support me in the web form module? And the answer is yes. It's just a matter of how I've got to sort it out over the next year. Oh, JD, she looks awesome. <laughs> okay, that's it. I'm yeah, done. questions. That was awesome, Jacob. But, you know, web form, every, it just, blows my mind every time I learn all these new things and, and best of luck with Sitecore and all the appreciation for all the support you've done on Webform and Drupal and the community in, in large. But uh, yeah, so thank you. And uh, definitely any questions, uh, I look forward to hearing it. Well, you've definitely inspired me to use it. Um, wow, it's great. I mean, I'm glad you hit on sort of the features and the complexity of it all. Um, gave us that overview. So yeah, it's great. Yeah, there's lots more information yeah, out there. Really there is. So, it's it's yeah. like a different, whole different thing. Um, yeah, and uh, good luck with the puppy. It sounds, you know, people are getting puppies. That's a good thing. Oh yeah, I mean, I by the way, I had like some people know like I've had a dog. I had a dog for 16 years. He made it through. I'm writing a blog post about it because it's like he lasted. He made it 16 years. Made it through COVID, but. Uh -huh. It reached a point in June where I was like, he was, it was time. Yeah. And, you know, I can't live without a dog, even though everyone else is getting puppies. So I had to like, it's good. I have a, I knew the breeder, like the breeder who gave me my dog for that I got 16 years ago. I'm seeing her again on Friday. That's the relationship I have with her. Yeah. Honestly, that module is really great. And, um, you know, I, I've been working with forms a lot and, you know, I don't know. I was I've been using Entity Form for Drupal seven and doing a lot of hooks with um, mm -hmm. into it um, and stuff. But anyway, uh, it looks like this Web Form eight is. Um, I might look at it too for sort of registration stuff. You hit on that a little bit. Um, and I had some other modules I was going to look at regarding uh, registration and also hooking into sort of user profiles. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, hooking into the entity reference thing too, so that you can create sort of classes that then have a registration to them and then have a user and the user can, you know, it's all connected. So I'll definitely be looking at, at the website. Yeah, there are demos. I hinted at it, but didn't show them, but there is a demo of an event registration system and what it's showing you, and it's a full registration system. So from I'm beginning to end. Now. Did you say, where is that? Um, it's in the web form module. When you install it, it's demo event registration system oh, and it creates okay. three events and walks you, it basically shows you all the glue code, not glue code, but the configuration you would need to get that working. And I did a presentation at DrupalCon two years ago that really walked in detail on that one. And also you work for a university, there's an application evaluation demo which also shows that process of someone filling out a form, submitting it, and then people coming in and doing evaluations of that form, basically rating, you know, like they interview someone and then they have to say, I like this person, I don't like it. And it shows how to kind of, it's joining two types of web forms, an application and evaluation together um, using a block. Um, and that's a good recipe to look at too. 
Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. And Entity Form doesn't have a port for. Uh, no, it does. Port. I know. I, I don't know why I started using it. do. Anyway, anyway, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Obviously. Check out contact storage. I mean, the problem is you lose a lot. There's a lot of functionality here that just makes your life easier. I think um, one of the other interesting things you said was uh, among the, all of it, really. And and you're, um, Eric, um, you were just over my head, but that's okay. I mean, there's different <laughs> levels fun. of people here and that's okay. You know, I, not that, I mean, yeah, you, you. Oh, it's fine. I, I mean. It blows my I, mind that people, you know, the I, I, the level of, of expertise and that's why you guys get paid a lot of money yeah. out. Well, yeah, we wish, you know, no, no, thank you. But thank you though. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ac actually, um, um, uh, uh, teaching someone Git who has no, no familiarity with it at all. Right. You know, that it's just, just here, Jake. But, but, and, and it's yeah. really interesting to, to, to watch, to watch him acquire those skills. So what you saw me do on the command line, a lot of that git commit, git push, you know, you yeah, want to get real familiar with that. The whole config thing. Um, uh, well, at where, I, where I work too, there's, uh, they, you know, parcel things out. So there's people who set up the whole Drupal installation and get all that ready. And then, you know, I, so now I'm getting, I didn't wasn't even working locally. I was just like sending files up and installing modules and some things were locked down, but I wasn't like building it as I am now locally. So I'm, I'm really getting the taste of it all. Um, so I wasn't handling the configuration and I still don't on the production site, nor on the dev sites really just locally. So um, the configuration Plus it's droop late and the whole, yeah, it was, yeah. One yeah. of the big things I was wondering about Eric though, when you were talking was why would you, you were talking about these changes and you were using the slogan. Um, and I was wondering why you would use that process. Is it because you're updating like so many sites or do you want to sync in, you're building one site and you want to update something globally for like a hundred sites or something or? No, it was meant meant to be one to one, and and using the site slogan was was about as as trivial a thing as right. I could find um, that fits yeah, into configuration that still that still fits you know fit the the slots for for what it means to make a configuration change on your local system, right? Export that configuration from your database into your repo, push the change up to your you know your upstream system, and then import the configuration into your upstream system and then see that change come through, right? So slogan, right? I and mean, whatever, mm. right? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. And that and that's 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 the so before you before you get into any, like the, the config split or the ignore or any of that stuff, right? When you when you first start with, with Drupal 8, you, you'll 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 see all all of these well, well the first time you do a config export if you never do a config export you'll never see any of those files they're all held in the database but once you do a config export which is which is how you want to start to work because you, you know you don't want to preview you don't want to do so much work on your production system right like i was saying you don't want to you don't want to start you change a view or something like that and then you, you don't realize what you did and then it's all it's it, it's worse than it started out as so you want to be able to test all this stuff previous to, to actually making the deployment of the code right so the the problem that's the problem space and that problem space i think was was well solved from drupal 7 to drupal 8 by converting everything to to this to this yaml system to this configuration system so you you have you have the you know many many of these files but they all go in right you know you, you do an import and everything goes in if, if you have a problem there you got to stop. You got to figure out what you're doing. You don't want to have a problem on production, obviously. But that's that's the that's the general concept. Before you even start with the modules, think about just config export and, and what happens there. Where do those files go? What do those files mean? Thanks. So non sequitur. I think JD's baby's cuter than a puppy. No, yeah. I got to admit that. I show I'm the puppy. I'm loving the though. I know, but I'm showing a puppy and I look at the baby and I'm like, okay, babies are cuter than puppies. And it's rare that you, I, I mean, I got, I'm getting this, I've been looking at this puppy for two months yeah. and I've been like, there's literally, of, he's a peanut in this, you know. What is it? What kind of dog? Portuguese water dog. Portuguese water dog. Yeah, it's what Obama had. How big? Or has. They're big. This is a very, he's going to be 50 pounds. <laughs> 50 pounds? 
Yeah, a ton of energy. I, I'm kind of, yeah. Oh, man, he's cute. Oh, so cute. Yeah. I can't believe I've hung in there this long. It's 8.30, I'm going to eat. Yeah, no, I understand. I think, are we wrapping it up? Yeah. A couple yeah. of comments. I have. Um, Let me uh, yeah. talk sure, about yeah, the stay. next slide and yeah. all that. I'll stay yeah. on. Let him wrap up, and I'll I'll hang. I was going to say. I'm going to mute um, myself, and you took over. Good. Yeah. Um. Oh, right. you know, I was, was going to say my you know my cousins actually have a Portuguese water dog, and they are they have so much energy, and they love the water. Yeah. You know, they just every chance they get. Yeah. I'm four blocks from Prospect Park, so I was got very used to that. I, I I'm going to run this dog an hour every morning. It's like I I know the commitment. I love it. Keeps me healthy. Yep. Um, actually, I, I want to make a couple of comments. Um, you know, I, I, both of you, it was great. Um, uh, in Eric, in terms of the, uh, there was a question regarding sort of the conditional split versus. Um, uh, I guess it, it used to be called blacklisting. Uh, and, and the way um, I've been using it, and I'm not sure if this is a proper way, but I, I sort of take it to mean that um, anything, if, if a module isn't gonna be used on production and I use the production as sort of the, the default, then I put that on the blacklist. So if it's not like, so something like um, dev module, yeah, I'm only going to use it on local or dev, mm -hmm. and then it's not going to, I don't want to enable it on production. Exactly. Oh. And then for conditional, it would be if each environment has a different setting, then I would use a conditional. Oh, um, good. No, I get that. Yes. Yeah, so, so like, you know, since we're using Acquia, Acquia for each environment has a different ID that you know, it requires. Mm -hmm. So for something like that, I would use a conditional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I, to I totally get that. Yeah. Good. Yep. So so that would so that would so let's see. So you're doing. So on your local, you're you're putting your you're putting your devel uh, configuration into conditional split, and you're doing the same thing on um, develop environment and stage and and whatever else you have before before um, production. But on production, it's not clicked. So the develop module would be on a blacklist. Yes, on production, um, right? Yes, on production. Okay. Um, okay. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So, so that and and that that help and um, yeah, that Rolf, I, th I think, um, I think I think that helps to further clarify something that I, I wasn't wasn't able to really answer that well because we're we're lucky we don't really use we don't really use conditional splits we're we're just you know a module here or a module there you know. And then we were able to show the, the, the mail system how, you know, it, do, it does in fact move it into the split, but anyway. Um, and then Jacob, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I know we're running late, so I'll try, I mean, I'll try to make this quick. Um, like before Drupal 8, you know, web forms, you know, that was sort of my go-to, but since Drupal 8, I've started using contact form that's in the core. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my take so far is that you know, contact form, it's nice, it, you know, and it's good to use for like sort of simpler things. But if I want more features or functionality, I, I think web form is sort of the way to go. Is that? Yeah, absolutely. I would always recommend starting with contact form. If you need a simple contact form, like someone wants a bottom of the page, six fields. Mm -hmm. Yeah, use contact form. It's the issue is if you need to build an advanced system where you need some like very specific requirements or mm -hmm. also i will say one thing that i've found is like i just have this project where they're like we want completely custom designed forms like completely custom layout custom behaviors and it's been a lot easier to do it in web form because we have these you can manipulate the render array a little easier you can go in and like t make little subtle tweaks to the form little alignment issues um and multi, you know, there's, yeah, it's advanced stuff. Basically, if you need to build forms on your site, you should use the web form module. If you need a form, use the contact in core. Okay. 
now, does the web form provide encryption of the database or is that on a separate level? It's a separate module. Okay. There's a web form encrypt module that'll encrypt the data in that table, the submission data table, it'll encrypt it. That limits what you can do with views, but okay. you know that I think for certain sites, they do it that way. I, I more and more just put it in a remote storage. Don't, okay. don't put it in Drupal. It's a very simple statement. All right. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Well, thank you both no of you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Yeah, excellent talks, excellent yeah. conversation. Thanks, everyone. So, and let's do it again. Let's do it again yeah. on January thirteenth. Uh, you can RSCP now. The RSCPs are open, and we are going to have two talks: one about the Lightning distribution uh, of Drupal, and the other one about cracking Drupal. Oh, those are great speakers. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, again more great speakers you guys if you would like to speak email us at speak at drupalnyc.org we'd love to hear from you you can also reach out to us in our slack community any uh experience level and any length uh we love to hear what you want to talk about and finally there is an after party uh drupal chicago is having a year-end celebration and we are thinking of crashing it so join us at that zoom link there and uh keep the party going and again, uh, you know, thanks to the speakers. That was awesome, uh, Eric and, and Jacob. No problem. Excellent talks. Yeah. No, my, my pleasure. Okay, yeah. send me the 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 Zoom link in Slack. Yeah, I want to let's get that in Slack. Yeah, we'll we'll get it's it in on Zoom the and Meetup Slack. channel. Oh. Oh, there it is. Oh, thanks. Got it. Yep, got it. I'll right. cross that. Okay, see you there. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. That's December. Right. Right. Okay. Bye.